A frightening scene from London tonight, a new terror scare. Police heading off a suspected attack right near Parliament, and you will see the knives all over the ground. Armed officers taking down a suspected terrorist in the heart of the British capital, pinning him against a wall just steps from the Houses of Parliament. Moments earlier, wrestling the man to the ground in the middle of a crosswalk, discovering knives in his backpack. I think it was about five knives there, up to seven maybe. Authorities calling the arrest part of an ongoing counterterrorism operation. The suspect, a 27-year-old British citizen, on their radar. This is where police took down the suspect. You can see it's packed with tourists. And just a few hundred yards that way, the Prime Minister's residence. Over there, the Houses of Parliament. Security in the area stepped up last month after Khalid Massoud ran over pedestrians on Westminster Bridge, killing four and injuring dozens, then stabbing a police officer to death. Today's scene, a chilling reminder of a new reality. David, police say they are still investigating, but there is no immediate known threat to the public. Dick Im Übrigen nicht nur muslimische Frauen, jede Frau kann ein Kopftuch tragen. Und wenn das so weitergeht, und damit bin ich schon bei der nächsten Frage, bei dieser äh, tatsächlich um sich greifenden Islamophobie, äh, wird noch der Tag kommen, wo wir alle Frauen bitten müssen, ein Kopftuch zu tragen. Alle. Als Solidarität gegenüber jenen, die es aus religiösen Gründen tun. German MPs have approved a partial ban on the Burka. The draft law stipulates that public servants will be forbidden from wearing the full-face veil while at work. The move comes after Chancellor Angela Merkel called for a ban on the burqa wherever legally possible. In February, the southern state of Bavaria, ruled by the Christian Social Union, the sister party to Merkel's conservatives, said it would ban the veil in schools, universities, government buildings and polling stations. Merkel is facing elections in the autumn and has lost support to the anti-immigrant alternative for Germany over the migrant crisis. German Chancellor Angela Merkel is proposing a complete rethink of border controls in the Schengen zone where there is freedom of movement between member states. Wir haben uns einen Raum der Freiheit geschaffen. The space for freedom and security have their limits. And where those limits aren't the national ones anymore, then we have to protect the international borders. We will rethink what needs to be rethought. To accept this Schengen zone as a space that also defines the external boundaries means to completely rethink them. Well, Merkel's remarks there do come after reports that thousands of terrorists are among the migrants arriving in the EU. Peter Oliver has more. This was revealed in the German news weekly Der Spiegel that thousands of former Taliban fighters and officials may have come here to Germany under the cover of the over one million uh, refugees and migrants that have arrived in Germany over the last two years. Now, RT reached out to the Office of Federal Migration and Refugees here in Germany, and they confirmed that there is a risk. It is true that people in the hearings indicate that they've been members of the Taliban. These may be persons who argue, especially as young people, that the Taliban forcibly recruited them and then they later fled. Well, the Spiegel also reported that over 70 Afghans are currently being investigated by an overstretched federal prosecutor's office for having potential links to the Taliban government and also having been former Taliban fighters. Well, this is a, a remarkable and truly disturbing story that's come out. Um, a 28-year-old um, member, enlisted member of the armed forces, a senior lieutenant, has been taken into custody by authorities and has been investigated by the federal prosecutor over claims that um, he had registered as a refugee back in 2015, even applied for asylum in 2016, um, had then in this year, 2017, planted a firearm, planted a gun in a bathroom uh, in the airport in Vienna. 
Now, it, we understand that uh, prosecutors are investigating on the basis that his intention had been to carry out some form of attack in the, um, in the airport there and to blame this attack on refugees. Now, it's, there's going to be a lot of questions raised over how this German soldier was able to register as a refugee, described as having German heritage and speaking no Arabic whatsoever. Um, a lot of questions to be raised there. But what we're hearing from police who are investigating is that they think that they've stopped potentially a very serious incident from occurring. At the end of January, he hid a loaded firearm in a toilet at Vienna airport. According to an investigation, the prosecutor says the suspect was planning a particularly serious act of violence. People are rallying under the motto, neither Le Pen nor Macron, against finance and fascism. It follows a national call for students to block and occupy their high schools. Now, these protesters say this is about both candidates, Macron and Le Pen. They want neither Macron, neither Le Pen. They say this is a case of fascism versus capitalism, and neither candidate is one that they want to support in this second round. Now, Colin, I, I just want to show you some of the damage right behind behind me. Uh, this is a bank and you might be able to see where it's been smashed. Things are getting tense between Israel and Syria with the latest provocation coming before sunrise Thursday. Syria says Israel hit a military facility near the Damascus airport targeting a weapons supply that Israel says was headed for Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah is an Islamist political and militant group that's violently opposed to Israel's existence. The group formed during Israel's occupation of Lebanon in the 80s. Syria's regime is allies with both Hezbollah and Iran. And Israel says Iran is using that connection to funnel weapons and resources to Hezbollah. So it's safe to say Israel is intent on keeping Hezbollah from getting more weapons. The US has also attacked the Syrian regime directly, but President Trump hasn't signaled a willingness to get more involved. Historically, Israel's Middle Eastern conflicts have drawn material support from the US. Defense ministers from scores of countries have gathered in the Russian capital Moscow to attend the annual Moscow Conference on International Security, MCIS. During the conference, the participants discussed a whole range of issues, including measures to tackle terrorism and security problems in Europe and in the Middle East. Addressing the conference, Iranian Defense Minister Hossein Dakhkan stressed the necessity of stripping Israel of its chemical and nuclear arms in a bid to have a Middle East free from nuclear weapons weapons. The Khan also touched on the issue of terrorism, warning the US and Saudi Arabia about the consequences of supporting terror groups. The Brigadier General also said that Tehran, Moscow and Damascus would eventually defeat terrorists in war-torn Syria. Speaking to Press TV, the Khan called Syria the front line of the war against terror at the moment. He also said the US and its allies were seeking to destabilize Syria in a bid to achieve their goals. The measures that the U.S. has taken in Syria only lead to the strengthening of the positions of terrorist groups and to weakening the government of Syria. From the very beginning, the U.S. used all possible allies to increase tensions in the country, but they still have not been able to achieve their goals. Some analysts believe Iran and Russia are the only peacekeepers in the Middle East. Why our likely opponents do not come to the conference? They have nothing to tell. They must negotiate, say something to make proposals for which they must be responsible. But they are not here. There is a firm impression that there are two remaining peacekeepers in the Middle East, Russia and Iran. Prior to Dehkan's comments, his Russian counterpart Sergei Shaigu said the coordinated efforts made by Russia, Iran and Turkey had facilitated peace talks between the Syrian government and armed opposition groups. Well, Russia lost an important tool in its intelligence arsenal today. One of the Navy's spy ships sunk. That was after colliding with a freighter. 
in the Black Sea near the Turkish coast. Officials say about 80 people on board the vessel were safely evacuated. According to Turkey's state-run news agency, the prime minister called his Russian counterpart to express sadness over the incident. Russia has recently used spy ships like this one near the east coast of the United States, at one point coming within 17 miles of land. The Pentagon has also criticized Turkey's recent airstrikes on Kurdish positions in Syria and Iraq, saying they are putting U.S. military personnel at risk. We let the Turks know that uh, the uh, amount of time that was being provided for the strikes was inadequate for us to assure safety of our forces on the ground. We had forces within six miles uh, of the strikes. There was less than an hour of um, notification time uh, before the strikes were conducted. That's not enough time. And this was notification, certainly not coordination, as you would expect from the a uh, partner and an ally in the fight against ISIS. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's talks with President Vladimir Putin were intended to focus on some long disputed islands, but there was also a more urgent topic demanding their attention North Korea. As close neighbors of the Korean Peninsula, the two countries agreed to cooperate closely to help defuse tensions in the region. China is also trying to step in. It said the U.S. defense system in South Korea undermines regional stability and all parties should be seeking a peaceful solution. But Beijing is also demonstrating military strength. China will continue to conduct simulation targeted exercises and tests of our new weaponry. Two U.S. Army Rangers were killed in eastern Afghanistan during a raid on Islamic militants linked to ISIS. Neither has been identified. David Martin has more. The firefight took place just south of this ISIS cave complex, where earlier this month the U.S. dropped the largest non-nuclear bomb it has ever used in combat. This video, taken by local Afghan police, represents the first confirmed pictures of the destruction caused by the 23,000-pound massive ordnance air blast bomb. U.S. officials refuse to release any estimate of the number of ISIS fighters killed, but say anyone above ground or hiding in the caves when the bomb hit is now dead. American officers who inspected the site reported no evidence of civilian casualties. Just a short distance south, in the same valley close to Afghanistan's border with Pakistan, several senior ISIS leaders were hiding out in a compound. When American Special Operations Forces, along with Afghan commandos, conducted a helicopter assault on the compound, two U.S. Army Rangers were killed and a third soldier wounded in a firefight which lasted about an hour. They were the second and third American servicemen to die in combat in Afghanistan this year. Police in Connecticut might soon be able to use drones equipped with lethal weapons. The state's House of Representatives is moving on a bill that would make using weaponized drones a crime. That is, unless you're a cop. Law enforcement officers could legally equip drones with things like tear gas, as well as more lethal stuff like explosives and other weapons. Critics argue Connecticut could set a dangerous precedent if the bill becomes law. Civil liberties groups argue weaponized drones can be misused and lead to increased instances of excessive force. But supporters of arming the aerial objects say this is the future of policing. They argue it's better to put rules in place now before drone technology expands. In 2015, North Dakota have made it legal to put non-lethal weapons on police drones, but if the Connecticut bill passes, it would be the first state to allow deadly weapons on the flying devices. Authorities in Indian-administered Kashmir have banned social media. On April 26th, the government ordered internet service providers to block 22 services. The ban, which includes Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp, is set to last one month. Authorities said social media has been misused by anti-national and anti-social elements to damage peace in the area. Clashes between Kashmiri demonstrators and Indian security forces have been commonplace since a protested election on April 9th, when at least eight people were killed. Certain photos and videos shared on social media have incited anger in Kashmir, including one of a Kashmiri man strapped to the front of an Indian army jeep, apparently being used as a human shield. Kashmir has been divided between India and Pakistan since 1947, with both countries claiming the territory in full. Most residents of the Indian portion either want independence or a merger with Pakistan. Some scientists want to perform head transplants in humans. Considering we are not there yet, some researchers are experimenting with animals. 
A group of scientists recently engaged in such an endeavor to identify potential blood flow and rejection problems. The procedure used involved starting with three rats to end up with a two-headed one. Of the original trio, one was the donor and another the recipient. The third was there to ensure there was not an interruption in the blood supply to the donor's brain during surgery. To that end, the head and shoulders of rat number three were separated from the rest of its body. The upper portion was then sewn onto the donor and the blood flowed through a tube and into the donor rat's brain. Meanwhile, the main supplies of recipient and donor were becoming one, as their major veins had since been connected. This procedure was performed on a number of trios, and according to the scientists, 14 groups survived for roughly 36 hours. And that is the opioid crisis in America. Opioids were involved in the overdose deaths of more than 33,000 Americans just in 2015, more than any other year on record, according to new data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This comes as Brayburn Pharmaceuticals develops an implant to address the challenges addicts face while maintaining treatment. Characterize the opioid crisis for us and tell us about this implant and how it works. Uh, the crisis, as you say, is taking um, the lives of uh, 33,000 Americans each year. We are losing the battle at this point. It is an epidemic. At Braeburn, we're trying to bring innovation to the treatment of, of opioid addiction so that we can help make a dent. Um, and this tiny implant is our first product. Uh, it was approved by the FDA last year. Um, it goes under the skin. Four of them go under the skin in the upper arm and lasts for six months, delivering buprenorphine at a steady blood level for the entire time so that the patient doesn't have cravings and doesn't have to worry about taking the medicine, doesn't have to worry about chasing it, uh, running after it, having it be stolen or lost, um, and really feel like they can focus on the rest of their life. Can I see that? Sure. Yeah, wow, okay. Yeah, so Go what, ahead. what exactly is this medicine that this produces? Right. Um, it contains buprenorphine. Um, in uh, the opioid uh, addiction treatment, we have three medicines that have been proven um, over and over. Studies have shown that medication as part of an overall treatment in treating opioid addiction reduces morbidity and mortality by 85%. And buprenorphine is a gold standard medicine that's contained in this um, implant called probufine. Um, it's our first innovation. We have a whole kind of pipeline of innovations coming. We have a, a weekly and a monthly shot. Um, also for um, opioid addiction to, uh, that contain buprenorphine uh, so that we can treat patients from the day they start um, treatment to when they're much more stable when they're candidates for uh, the implant. Finally tonight here, America Strong, the teacher determined to give every child a voice, convinced he could get them to open up, even flourish, if only they felt accepted. Tonight, watch what happens here when he brings a small camera, a tripod, and finally gives them the starring role. He carries with him a simple toolkit, a tripod, a camera, and a light. Chris Ulmer travels the country to find children who rarely get their moment to shine. It's nice to meet you. That's Lana in Boston, and this is Sophia. Tell me one thing that's special about you. I'm busy. Chris is a special education teacher from Jacksonville, Florida, who had an idea that he would crisscross the country to make sure the lonely children we're lonely no longer. Welcome. I'm happy we got to meet today. Mm -hmm. I'm happy too. I saw so much of myself in the kids. I was always a little bit of a loner. And when I went into that classroom, I saw myself. Hi, everyone. A teacher who was in the classroom at first, but who is now determined to take what he learned from the children far beyond. I saw children who could flourish, who could grow if they were just accepted. How's that feel? <laughs> That's eight-year-old Marilee in Tampa Bay. At first, he wanted to create a series of books with the faces and the stories behind them. He would call it Special Books by Special Kids. His idea was rejected by 50 publishers, so he decided to do it on his own, creating a nonprofit and his own Facebook page with more than a million followers now. Hey, Cam. Some of the children he meets are nonverbal, but he's giving them a moment, too.